Hello, welcome to my channel, Anglican Aesthetics. Uh, in this video, I want to give a quick summary case uh, against Roman Catholicism. And again, the spirit of this video is not to say Roman Catholicism, Roman Catholics are bad, that they're not Christians. Uh, they are brothers and sisters in Christ. The purpose of this video is to give a one-stop shop sort of case for why we think the Roman church is in need of reform and why we want the Roman church to be reformed. So what are the sort of doctrinal problems with the Roman church? I won't be comprehensive here, or rather I won't be exhaustive, but I do intend to be comprehensive. So we're going to start with a kind of class of arguments, modus tollens. So a modus tollens style argument is if P, then Q, not Q, therefore not P. So, for instance, if uh, if it is raining, then I am wet. I am not wet, therefore it is not raining. That might be a, a more or less <laughs> a, a, a bad ver a bad argument, but uh, you get the sort of idea there. That if that consequent is false then the antecedent is false. Now, some people I've noticed when you sort of deal with the modus tollens, they'll say, okay, well, this is the fallacy of, uh, of affirming, uh, affirming the consequent or denying the antecedent. So that fallacy goes something like this. Uh, if it is raining outside, then I am wet. It is not raining outside, so denying the antecedent, therefore I am not wet. Okay, so that's a fallacy. That's a formal fallacy known as denying the antecedent because I might be in the pool, right? So it, it doesn't follow from the falsity of the antecedent that the consequent is false. Or there's a different sort of version of this called um, affirming the consequent. So if it is raining outside, then I am wet. I am wet, therefore it is raining outside. That is also a fallacious argument because that infers the truth of the antecedent from the truth of the consequent. That's also false. What a modus tollens does is uh, uh, infers the falsity of the antecedent from the falsity of the consequent. That is, if the antecedent were true, then certain consequence would follow. Because those consequences don't follow, therefore, or aren't true, therefore the antecedent is false. So, in this case, I'm going to give two kinds of arguments, or two distinct arguments, and I'm going to support this with historical evidence here. So, premise one, if Roman Catholicism is true, then you must believe that Rome can restrict what Jesus has given. Premise two, we must not believe that Jesus can restrict, uh, that Rome can restrict what Jesus has given. Ergo, Roman Catholicism is not true. Okay, so then the second kind of argument. If Roman Catholicism is true, then you must accept all magisterial teaching with religious submission of mind and will. I'll define what that term means from De Verbum, from other uh, magisterial documents. Premise two, if you must accept all magisterial teaching, then all magisterial teaching must be safe. Premise three, not all magisterial teaching is safe. Therefore, you must not accept all magisterial teaching with religious submission of mind and will, and therefore Roman Catholicism is false. Okay, so let's proceed. In defense of this idea that if Roman Catholicism is true, and I'm covering this first because this is going to be relevant just throughout our video here, uh, if Roman Catholicism is true, then you must accept all magisterial teaching with religious submission of mind and will. So this comes from the dogmatic constitution Lumen Gentium, which was promulgated at Vatican II. And it reads as follows. Bishops teaching in communion with the Roman pontiff are to be respected by all as witnesses to divine Catholic truth. In matters of faith and morals, the bishops speak in the name of Christ and the faithful are to accept their teaching and adhere to it with a religious assent. 
And I've emboldened the relevant part here as well for the Roman pontiff. This re religious submission of mind and will must be shown in a special way to the authentic magisterium of the Roman pontiff, even when he is not speaking ex cathedra. That is, so this is defining what it means to submit to the Roman pontiff, to the magisterium with religious submission of mind and will. That is, it must be shown in such a way that his supreme magisterium is acknowledged with reverence. The judgments made by him are sincerely adhered to according to his manifest mind and will. So the faithful are obligated to adhere to the promulgations of the Roman pontiff, even when he's not speaking ex cathedra. Now, you might think maybe this is wrong, but you still have an obligation to adhere to it. And if you think it's wrong, then you have to sort of dissent respectfully, tentatively, hesitantly, uh, but you're obligated and the faithful are expected to obey the Roman pontiff with the religious submission of mind and will. Okay. This is also in the Professio Fide. Now, the Professio Fide was promulgated by the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. This is sort of the official, an official body of the Vatican that exposits magisterial teaching, as well as a motu proprio by uh, John Paul II uh, called Ad Tuendum Fidem. So it's in defense of the faith. And the commentary on the Professio Fide promulgated by the Congregation of the Doctrine of the Faith says the following. The third proposition of the Professio Fide states, moreover, I adhere with religious submission of will and intellect to the teachings which either the Roman pontiff or the College of Bishops enunciate when they exercise their authentic magisterium, even if they do not intend to proclaim these teachings by a definitive act. To this belong all those teachings on faith and morals presented as true or at least as sure even if they have not been defined with a solemn judgment or proposed as definitive by the ordinary and universal magisterium so the magisterium if it promulgates and presents something as true even though it's not speaking infallibly so it might be wrong nevertheless the faithful have an obligation to hear that and obey that in the same way that I might have, let's say, an obligation to uh, obey a doctor, my doctor's medical orders, uh, because I'm assuming the doctor is more reasonable than me, is more uh, skilled and learned than I am in the field. And so I might act out of a sort of sense of conviction adhering to that doctor's judgments. Much more so on Roman Catholic theology are the faithful expected to adhere to the magisterial judgments with religious submission of will and intellect. So they're expected to obey it. There's no wiggle room for a Roman Catholic. You have to obey what the magisterium teaches, even if it's not teaching infallibly. So we go on. Okay, so this is where I'm going to argue for that first premise of that first argument. If you recall, that first premise is that if Roman Catholicism is true, then the, then the Church of Rome and the Magisterium has an authority to restrict the gifts that Jesus has given to his people. I'm hoping that we all agree on premise two, that the Church does not, in, even in principle, have the right to restrict that which Jesus has allowed. That is to say, where Jesus has said you may, the Church cannot say you may not. And you cannot under pain of damnation. Absolutely not. Because to do that would be to elevate the church's voice over our Lord Jesus's voice. Okay, so this text right here is from the Council of Constance in 1415. This is where Jan Hus was condemned. And one of the things he was condemned for was the uh, was trying to administer communion in both kinds. And Jan Hus's conviction was that because the Lord Jesus gave the Eucharist in both kinds, and because this was practiced by the early church in the first 300 years, therefore we should do this too. We should give communion in both kinds. So here's what Rome says to that. And remember, the Council of Constance is considered an ecumenical council in Rome's telling, so it bears this magisterial authority 
In the name of the holy and undivided Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Certain people in some parts of the world have rashly dared to assert that the Christian people ought to receive the holy sacrament of the Eucharist under the forms of both bread and wine. Although this sacrament was received by the faithful under both kinds in the early church, nevertheless it was received under both kinds only by those confecting it, and by the laity only under the form of bread. For it should be very firmly believed and in no way doubted that the whole body and blood of Christ are contained under both the form of bread and wine. Therefore, since this custom was introduced for good reasons by the Church and the Holy Fathers, and has been observed for a very long time, it should be held as a law which no one may repudiate or alter at will without the Church's permission. And so it goes on to say that those who stubbornly assert the opposite are to be confined as heretics and severely punished by the local bishops and excommunicated. They're to be assumed as heretics. So we go on. Session 13 goes on that they fall under the priests who give the Eucharist in both kinds fall under the pain of excommunication. And those who may have accidentally given communion in both kinds, uh, after having been taught that they should not, uh, should repent and a salutary penance should be enjoined on them. So think about this. A priest who's acting out of the conviction that they cannot restrict what Jesus has given to his people falls under either the pain of excommunication if that priest doesn't repent. And if that priest repents, then they are enjoined a penance, right? And a penance, remember, in as we've covered before, in the theology of penance, works of satisfaction are meant to make atonement, to lift the debt of punishment, the temporal debt of punishment. And so it's being assumed that if a priest erred, quote unquote, by giving his people communion in both kinds, that they have accrued the temporal debt of punishment to themselves and as such need to perform penance. The claim being made here is that a priest who is convinced that they ought to follow Jesus in giving Eucharist in both kinds, and they ought to follow the example of the early church that heard the Lord's command for the first 300, 500 years, and gave Eucharist in both kinds, except under exceptional circumstances where you might have someone who was sick or something like this. If a priest acts out of that conviction, they either fall under the pain of excommunication if they don't repent. And if they do repent, well, they incurred temporal debt on themselves for simply following Jesus's command. And remember, the council acknowledges that Jesus gave the apostles Eucharist in both kinds, and that the apostles gave the church Eucharist in both kinds, and that the early church practiced Eucharist in both kinds. Now, some Roman Catholics will say, well, we don't do this anymore. And you can go to a Roman Catholic church and take communion in both kinds. So, you know, we've heard the critique, we've changed. That misses my point. My point is that Roman Catholic theology commits you to this idea that the magisterium had the authority to do this in the first place, that they had the authority to restrict from the people of God that which Jesus said you may have. And to do this under the pain of excommunication, that is, the Church of Rome claims that she can say where Jesus has said, you may, she can say, you may not, and if you do, you will be damned. I do not believe the Church of Rome has that kind of authority. So you're committed to believing that as a Roman Catholic if you're being consistent. However, if you, if you over and against being consistent, prioritize the authority of the Lord Jesus, who speaks over his church, whose word stands over the church in judgment, holding the church to account, then you have to reject the Roman Catholic self-understanding of authority. Okay, so here's another example uh, of, I think, what's deeply problematic. Now, Recall, the Roman Catholic Church claims that because of the aid of divine assistance, there is a kind of dispensation of grace given such that even in the magisterium's non-infallible teaching, the faithful can adhere to this with religious submission of mind and will. 
that implies that it's safe, right? Like if you can adhere to it with religious submission of mind and will, even though it might be wrong, the claim is that the Holy Spirit is so working in the magisterium so as to make religious submission of mind and will possible. So it shouldn't be harmful to your soul to submit to the magisterium if that's true. But here's the problem. There are many instances where the magisterium has taught things that are explicitly harmful to souls. I'll give an example. The uh, Pope Urban, uh, he issued a plenary indulgence during the crusade. Now, if you recall, a plenary indulgence carries the promise of the remission of all temporal debt. So in the Roman Catholic system, you accrue two kinds of debt, the eternal debt of punishment and the temporal debt of punishment. In baptism, both are completely wiped away with the merits of Christ, such that if you were to die right after baptism, you would go straight to heaven, you wouldn't go to purgatory. But if you commit mortal sin, then whereas confession or the desire for confession and absolution is enough to wipe away the eternal debt of punishment, the temporal debt of punishment still remains and hangs over you. And so penance has the function of making up for the temporal debt of punishment, for making satisfaction for the temporal debt of punishment. And any remaining debt of punishment, God will exact on you in purgatory. So purgatory has an explicitly punitive function in Roman Catholic theology. With that in mind, think about uh, what this sort of indulgence does in this context, right? So in the medieval ages, uh, purgatory was seen to be just as bad as hell. Aquinas thought that the same fires that constituted the judgment of hell would torture those in purgatory as punishment. And that wasn't ruled out at the Council of Trent. Now, the Council of Trent deliberately says, okay, we're not going to like, we're not going to specify the specific nature of purgatory, but it is punitive. And Bellarmine's view, which Bellarmine sides with Aquinas on this, is not condemned at Trent. It's a permissible view to hold within this idea that purgatory is punitive. So if you're thinking about that as a layman, that I might go to hell for like a thousand years, basically, right? I might be tortured for my sins for a thousand years. But there's this chance to go slaughter the pagans, right? To, and I'll have immediate remission of sins. That's sanctioned with magisterial authority. I'm arguing that that, in fact, is a harmful teaching to the flock. Because what you're doing is you're inciting a Christian to violence with the promise that in engaging violence, they'll remit the debt of their sin. Rather than encouraging the peaceable disposition of Jesus who laid down his life at the cross for his enemies, you're encouraging Christians to take up the sword over and against pagans, those very people who we should be trying to convert and reach with the gospel of Christ. And doing that, inciting that in the name of, of them having the full remission of the debt of sin. To believe that is harmful to your soul. Because it quashes the kind of love that you're supposed to have for your enemies. The kind of love that would lay your life down for your enemies, for your conquering oppressors, just like Jesus on the cross prays, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. He is the ultimate exemplar of Christian obedience in the face of oppression. Rome, in this instance, encourages Christians to do the exact opposite. And that is to quash the kind of love, the kind of virtue that Christ calls us to have in our souls. There's more. Um, the magisterium also sanctions, I would argue, idolatrous prayers to Mary. And, and so you often hear this, right, in, in discussions between Protestants and Catholics. Early on, Roman Catholics will say, well, you would have an especially righteous person pray for you, right? And if it was just that, like, I wouldn't really have an issue with that, right? Uh, and there are some Protestants that, that would that say, okay, well, asking saints to pray for you, how can you do that because they're dead? Uh, like, I, I, I don't know. I, I don't really find that problematic. 
Um, but that's not all that Rome does, right? They're not just saying, uh, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us, right? There is a prayer. The Hail Mary is actually, I don't think that's a bad thing to say. This is different, right? So this is the Immaculata. Uh, Immaculata, <laughs> uh, sanctioned by um, I, uh, Maximilian Kobe, Saint Maximilian Kobe, and it's given uh, to the magisterium, to to, uh, to by the magisterium rather to the people of God, as something you can pray when you consecrate yourself to Mary through the militia of the Immaculata. That was established in the 20th century. And there was a plenary indulgence assigned to this, that if you sort of join the disciplines of the militia of the Immaculata, you can receive this plenary indulgence. And one of the prayers you pray in this process of joining the MI goes as follows. O Immaculata, queen of heaven and earth, refuge of sinners and our most loving mother, God has willed to entrust the entire order of mercy to you. I, Sean, your name, I, Sean, a repentant sinner, cast myself at your feet, humbly imploring you to take take me with all, all that I am and have, wholly to yourself as your possession and property. Please make of me of all my powers of soul and body of my whole life, death and eternity, whatever most pleases you. If it pleases you, use all that I am and have without reserve, wholly to accomplish what was said of you. She will crush your head. Okay, so note this, wholly to accomplish what was said of you, Mary. She will crush your head and you alone have destroyed all heresies in the world. Let me be a fit instrument in your immaculate and merciful hands for introducing and increasing your glory to the maximum in all the many straight and indifferent souls. This is not the language of just asking her for prayer. This isn't an exalted honorific. This isn't like saying right reverend father in God to a bishop or, you know, right holy mother, right? This, this isn't just an honorific. What's explicitly being done is that the language of scripture that's used to plea uh, towards God, to ask God of things, is being applied to Mary. The entire order of mercy is entrusted to her, right? That, that Mary somehow has the right to have all that I am when all that I am ought to be given to God. That she, we are wholly her possession and property, that she alone has destroyed all heresies in the world, that she moves hearts, that she softens hearts, that she empowers us to be fit instruments in her merciful hands, that, that, she, that we are instruments in her hands to extend her glory. This is the, inch, the language of Yahweh. Yahweh is the one who uses instruments to extend his fame among the nations. This is never assigned to a creature in Second Temple Judaism. And even when you get those first prayers to Mary, right? We have one in the third century. You might have, well, like, Holy Mary, we fly to you in refuge, pray for us, right? It's an honorific, and it, it's an exalted honorific. But it's not saying this, right? It's not using the language of scripture about God and applying that to a creature. And certainly we don't find this in Second Temple Judaism. The whole order of mercy is Mary's. Her, she alone has destroyed all heresies in the world. And I know what people are going to say. Well, she alone has, uh, that's, that's uh, actually about, you know, we're saying that to her and through her to Jesus, right? Well, then it's not the case that she alone has destroyed all heresies in the whole world, right? When that language is used of Yahweh, uh, it's, it's used to identify Jesus as part of the divine identity. So, for instance, Isaiah says, Isaiah 45 has Yahweh saying, I alone created the heavens and the earth, right? Well, then in the New Testament, all things are created through Jesus, we infer from those facts that Jesus, therefore, is part of the divine identity because that language is used of him. Language that's only fitted to Yahweh is appropriated to Jesus. Well, here you have an explicit example of a prayer being offered to Mary that appropriates the language of the divine identity. That's idolatry. That liturgizes a heart. It trains a heart to view Mary as deity, 
And this has happened time and time again. This isn't just a theoretical issue, right? Uh, I have friends who have been in Latin America. My wife has been in Latin America. She's seen this happen where this, ha this has happened in Rome. My, my, one of my church history professors, Dr. Scott Manich, saw this happen where they were on this tour in Rome. They were looking at different things. And a woman on the tour who was a Roman Catholic uh, pauses, points to a, a statue of Mary and says, what you need to understand is Mary is God. Okay. Like, we, you can say as a Roman Catholic, well, they're just poorly catechized, right? They haven't studied these things. But when they're praying things like this under the sanction of the magisterium, what do you think is going to happen to their hearts and their heart's disposition towards Mary? They elevate her as God. So this is an example of a magisterial sanction for the people of God that is harmful to their soul. It goes on, right? So the Marian consecration, the morning consecration is another prayer sanctioned by the magisterium. So it's allegedly safe to pray. And it goes like this. My queen, my mother, I give myself entirely to thee. I show my devotion to thee. I consecrate to thee this day my eyes, my ears, my mouth, my heart, my whole being without reserve. Wherefore, good mother, as I am thine own, keep me, guard me as thy property and possession. Like, look, I, I don't I, I don't give my whole being to anyone without reserve except Christ. Right? Like that's not even true in marriage, right? You don't like, spouses don't give themselves wholly to each other without any reserve. And yet, uh, this is being asked, this is being declared safe, a safe prayer uh, for those who pray the Marian consecration. And they call themselves the property of Mary, that they are Mary's own. And this is the language, again, of Exodus 19. This is the language of 1 Peter 2, where the people of God are the possession and property of God. And it's being appropriated to Mary. That encourages idolatry. And again, one could say, well, theologically, you know, you're actually just consecrating yourself to Christ through Mary. But, like, you're, Mary's the object here, right? Mary's the... Like, if I say to someone, uh, I worship you, my God and King, and I love you, and I give you everything I am, right? And I say, well, you know, I really mean that to Jesus or something like that. We would know that was absurd. Like, like, that would be a really big cope. <laughs> uh, here, in the same way, when the language of the people of God are, and their relationship to Yahweh is appropriated to the church's relationship to Mary. Mary is being implicitly included in the divine identity, even when that's not Rome's intention. That's what happens when people pray these prayers. That's how their hearts can be formed because these prayers use idolatrous language that in any other case would include the object of that language in the divine identity. Okay, Eid Nostri Cordis. So this was a papal bull that authorized the Crusades against uh, the Waldensians. And the Crusades against the Waldensians were issued purely because of heresy. Okay, so it wasn't the case. Now, with the Crusades, I get there's a complicated history there, right? There's a real threat of a military invasion coming from the Islamic power to the Western world. Like, I get all of that. It gets, it's complicated in the Crusades, even though I still think authorizing a plenary indulgence to fight pagans is still harmful to souls for the reasons I just mentioned. Here, it's not that. It's that the people of God, Catholics, are being called to fight other Christians solely because of what they teach, to suppress their heresies. And the promise is being offered here for plenary indulgence for the remission of sins. In other words, there's a promise being offered that you could get the remission of the debt of your punishment by killing other Christians. Now, one might say, well, these aren't other Christians. These are heretics. Yeah, that, and man, that's such a cold, it's a very cold response, right? The Waldensians were actually very, all considered they were peace-loving people. And they start to fight back, of course, because they're being attacked, right, under military conquest. Uh, but they were peace-loving people. And their heresies were not a denial of Nicaea or Chalcedon or anything like this. 
they were a lot of their heresies were essentially what became protestant beliefs right so the denial of purgatory the denial of indulgence the elevation of scripture over tradition things like this they were they were killed for them and the claim of rome was that well it's actually safe for you to believe that in slaughtering these other people who have been baptized in the triune name you can get remission of your sins that's a, a teaching that is harmful to souls okay and finally amoris laetitia this is kind of this one's interesting to me because i actually agree with pope francis's pastoral council but i think it's internally inconsistent here's what i mean by that in roman catholic theology uh if you marry uh after divorcing let's say you've been validly married right and you divorce for any reason if you remarry so long as the first marriage was valid you're in a state of adultery your second marriage is invalid that's the claim now according to the code of a code of canon law here uh, those who are in these situations are in, ob in an objective state of sin and consequently they cannot receive the eucharistic communion as long as the situation of sin persists why for the same reason that two people living together who aren't married and they're fornicating can't receive the eucharist it's the exact same logic being applied because that is in roman catholic theology the state that these people are in now amoris laetitia says the following it is possible that an objective situation of sin which may not be subjectively culpable or fully such a person can be living in god's grace and can love and also grow in the life of grace and charity while receiving the church's help to this end and in the infamous footnote th uh, 351 the claim is made from pope francis that they can receive the eucharist these people who are living in an objective state of sin now michael lofton has has tried to claim well amoris laetitia is actually just saying that uh well after confession they can receive the eucharist and that's just consistent with what roman catholics have always taught but in truth it's not <laughs> that's you can read the document for for yourself uh pope francis agreed with the buenos aires bishops uh who implemented amoris laetitia he said that was the right and uh sort of implementation where those who are living in this second marriage which is canonically considered invalid can receive the eucharist right and like it wouldn't even make sense if all pope francis was saying is that well they can receive the eucharist after confession then that footnote wouldn't even need to exist right like that's just standard roman catholic teaching he wouldn't need to make that quote unquote clarification but of course what he's saying is that there are cases in which people can be living in what the roman catholic church thinks is adultery and yet not in mortal sin and knowingly so actually is what what's stated in the paragraph but there are complicated factors right like maybe in the second marriage they have children but they they've been sort of long-standingly faithful to each other suppose the first catholic was baptized catholic right and then he grows up and then he um, becomes a protestant let's say and then marries a protestant uh, that marriage is considered canonically invalid as we will see uh and so he's in a state of mortal he's in a state of a fornicating basically under roman catholic canon law uh actually there's a there's a couple uh, in our church who just played a tremendous role in shaping my wife and i and they were catholics uh and, th and they became protestants when they married uh their parents didn't attend the wedding uh because their parents said you're you're just fornicating your your marriage is invalid right so the claim being made in but like of course you know this couple has lived decades together and they've raised children and they've been really faithful to each other uh and the claim of rome is that they're in a state of mortal sin now amoris laetitia would say well like it would probably be impossible to dissolve that union or let's say for instance you had uh like this 18 year old he gets married there to some other 18 year old they make really stupid decisions they get divorced by 20 right and then the guy becomes a christian uh, and then later on he marries a christian right the claim is that that second marriage is invalid it's not a real marriage and so that person is in mortal sin or at least should be because they're fornicating pope francis is saying well they can be 
in this state of mortal sin of or sorry in the state of adultery of fornication and not be in mortal sin and so can receive the eucharist that's internally incoherent if you believe in the roman catholic teaching on marriage then amoris laetitia which is promulgated by in pope francis's magisterium would be harmful to your soul okay so here's the second kind of argument I'm going to make as well. Rome has a fundamentally non-apostolic character in the doctrines she teaches that the Reformation has critiqued. So, for instance, um, transubstantiation is claimed to be necessary to believe for salvation. Now, in Dei Verbum, Rome teaches that she's only an expositor of the apostolic teaching she only ever tells us what Rome teaches. Now, as I've pointed out in my video on effectual signification and the videos I've done on this, there were many church fathers that did not hold to transubstantiation, that explicitly denied the doctrinal content of transubstantiation. Irenaeus is among them, Pope Galatius, so a pope, is among them. Uh, Didymus is among them, Didymus the Blind. Uh, we have many examples of this. Um, Ambrosiaster, I think, is also among this. Uh, so that's that's interesting. That's significant. Now, Rome claims that you must believe in transubstantiation to be saved. But if that was the, if that's a legitimate exposition of the apostolic teaching, why is it that there were so many different views on the nature of the way the body and blood of Christ were present in the Eucharist in the early church? Right? And this persists right all the way up to Aqu Aquinas registers that people disagree on this. Dun Scotus, of course, thinks that other views are rational or reasonable because there's precedent for them. Uh, and of course, you know, you have the famous Red Bertus and Retramnus debate where Retramnus very clearly teaches uh, something that's not transubstantiation. And he's not condemned for it until until much later, until centuries later. Now, one might say, well, it's only damnable in light of the fact that Rome has ruled on it. So it's damnable in light of being a disobedient act to the church. But here's the problem. Not all acts of disobedience to the church are damnable, right? So, for instance, if the church says, uh, uh, I don't know, um, that... You know, we're, we we should fast on a Thursday and someone doesn't, right? That's not necessarily a damnable sin. It could be a sin and it can be mortal sin, but it's not necessarily damnable, right? So there's certain acts of even, even ways of not fully living in accordance with the teaching of the church that aren't damnable. So what is it that makes the belief in transubstantiation essential to salvation there needs to be a connection to the apostolic teaching if dei verbum is true right if rome is just expositing just sort of interpreting the apostolic teaching then there needs to be a logic present in the apostles teaching such that transubstantiation to believe it is necessary to salvation even though many church fathers did not believe in transubstantiation so that doctrine cannot be traced back to the apostles, not in any reasonable sense. Okay, here's another thing. The assumption of Mary is proclaimed as necessary to salvation in Vatican I. Now, in Vatican I, there were Roman Catholics who, who did not want this to happen. There were Roman Catholic theologians who were writing against this idea that the assumption of Mary should be necessary to believe for salvation. They were saying, with the East, if it's a pious belief, you can believe it, uh, but it shouldn't be required for salvation. So why would Vatican I proclaim it necessary to salvation? If Rome is just an expositor of the apostolic teaching, then there has to be something in the apostles' teaching that implies that believing it is necessary to salvation. But given that it was so radically absent in the early church, you can see Gavin's video on why Mary's assumption is indefensible. How can it be apostolic? How can, how can there be a logic present in the apostles' teaching that renders belief in it necessary to salvation? And if you say, well, it's not, right? Like, you know, Rome can just 
declare something as necessary to salvation and descent from Rome is damnable. Well, then it ceases the claim of Dei Verbum, where Rome is claimed to just be an expositor of the apostolic teaching is false. Because then they're just explicitly adding requirements, adding material to believe uh, that's necessary to salvation. So we go on. Icon veneration is declared necessary to salvation. This makes me uncomfortable, right? And I was kind of pushed to this by Gavin's video on, on icon veneration. Uh, I generally hold to the definition of the Seventh Ecumenical Council. Like, I, I think there's actually a good and right place for icon veneration. Here's the problem. The Seventh Ecumenical Council damns those, damns iconoclasts as heretics. It suspends them and excommunicates them. So remember, excommunication in the early church meant you were damned as a heretic. You were going to hell if you were excommunicated. And the Seventh Ecumenical Council here is claiming that if you believe this, uh, if you, you're an iconoclast, then you're damned. Even though there were fathers, as Gavin pointed out, church fathers that were iconoclasts. Now, I think they were wrong, right? I think these fathers who were iconoclasts were wrong. I don't think they were heretics. <laughs> like, I don't think Baptists or, or Presbyterians who are iconoclasts or anything. Like, that. like I don't think they're heretics. They're, they're going to hell because they don't venerate icons, right? Uh, so it adds this as a requirement to salvation, even though this can't be found in the early apostolic teaching. Okay, now the incoherence of the Catholic doctrine of marriage. So I gave an, an internal critique in Amoris Laetitia. Now I'm going to critique and show why the doctrine itself is not coherent, why the magisterial teaching on marriage is simply wrong and incoherent and doesn't make sense. It contradicts the Old Testament, right? So in the Old Testament, you could have someone who writes their spouse a certificate of divorce and they marry someone else. They're considered legitimately married in Israel, right? They're considered actually married. You see this all throughout the Old Testament. Marriage is a structure of nature. It's, it's not a social institution, right? According to scripture, it's a structure instituted in the sort of very depths of creation. So Rome, any church body, has just as much of a power to say this isn't marriage as I have to look at a tree and say this isn't a tree just because of my fiat, right? Marriage has natural sort of dynamics built into the, the fabric of human life that defines it, out of which it emerges. Rome is claiming that it can declare by fiat a structure of nature not to be what it is. And that doesn't make sense. It's certainly not apostolic. So the Eastern Orthodox Church, for instance, permits divorce and remarriage as an act of compassion. So while they recognize that uh, remarrying someone after a divorce, they would claim their sin involved in that. Nevertheless, they would not say that marriage is thereby invalid. It's a valid marriage. And so it, it's there's a significant part of the church that very much disagrees with Rome's doctrine. The magisterium, I don't think, can subvert nature. And there's, there's a further problem with this. Uh, David Bentley Hart, helpfully, he has an article with, which was written in 2019 around the, the sort of heat of debate or uh, stirring up uh, around Amoris Laetitia, and he writes the following. In his commentary on Matthew, for example, Origen, so there, there are lots of church fathers that actually believed uh, a marriage after a divorce was still valid, was still a valid marriage. So in his commentary on Matthew, for example, Origen notes that many of the bishops of his time permitted both divorce and remarriage among the faithful. Canon 11 of the Council of Arles recommends that a divorced man not remarry so long as his former wife still lives, but also grants that for healthy young men incapable of continence, uh, this would require of them, remarriage may prove necessary. Basil the Great instructed uh, Amphilochius of Iconium to allow men abandoned by their wives to remarry without penalty. It was he also who apparently established uh, an official penitential discipline for remarried laity. A second marriage, after either bereavement or divorce, requires one to two years of abstinence from the Eucharist, while third marriage requires three to five. 
These rules remain canonical, at least as late as the days of Theodore the Studite. Which is where, so this is 8th, 9th century, and Patriarch Nicephorus of Constantinople. Incidental remarks of Epiphanius of Salamis show that remarriage for the divorce in his day was, was not in his day regarded as an eternal bar to the sacramental life. I pulled up a, of a couple of primary sources here just to illustrate Hart's point, because here, as much as I don't like David Muntley Hart, he's right about this. Okay, here we go. So, can, can, uh, Canon 87 of the Council of Trullo says this. She who has left her... And so this is about important context, right? Uh, this is about uh, a man who has taken another wife, uh, ev even while his first wife is still living. She who has left her husband is an adulteress if she has come to another, according to the holy and divine Basil, who has gathered this most excellently from the prophet Jeremiah. If a woman has become another man's, her husband shall not return to her, but being defiled, she re shall remain defiled. And again, he who has an adulteress is senseless and impious. If, therefore, she appears to have departed from her husband without reason, he is deserving of pardon and she of punishment. And the pardon shall be given to him that he may be in communion with the church. Now, some would say, okay, well, it's just talking about, it's not talking about a guy who has remarried. It's just talking about a guy whose wife left him. Here's what the, the, the canon goes on to say. But he who leaves the wife lawfully given to him and shall take another is guilty of adultery by the sentence of the Lord. In other words, the context is talking about a guy who has taken another wife while his first wife is still living. And it's saying that there's a case, a situation here where that might be validly done. And so Rome's claim that this is apostolic cannot be substantiated. It goes against the Old Testament. It doesn't make sense with our Lord sort of rebuked to the Pharisees. Uh, it, it doesn't make sense with the acceptance that it was still a legitimate marriage. And it doesn't make sense to claim that there's this sort of widespread evidence that goes back to the apostles. It simply doesn't. So for reasons of scripture and tradition, we can say this is not apostolic. Okay, so now the arbitrariness of purgatory. So purgatory, recall, is retributive. This is from the Catechism of the Council of Trent. Finally, the punishment which the sinner endures disarms the vengeance of God and averts the punishment decreed against us. Thus, the apostle says, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But whilst we are judged, we are chastised by the Lord that we be not condemned with this world. If all this is explained to the faithful, it must have great influence in exciting them to perform works of penance. This, however, is not true in reference to all the advantages to be derived from satisfaction. For works of satisfaction are also medicinal, and are so many remedies prescribed to the penitent to heal the depraved affections of the soul, it is clear that those who do not satisfy for themselves can have no share in this fruit of penance. So, in a lot of contemporary discourse, you get this idea that penance is really about healing the soul. In the Catechism of the Council of Trent, that was a distinct function. Now, this word, finally, finally, the punishment which the sinner endures and disarms the vengeance of God, that comes after the paragraph describing the medicinal role of penance. These are seen as two distinct functions of penance. But here's the problem. Roman Catholic theology teaches that the, the merits of Christ are sufficient to wipe away all the temporal debt of punishment. This is why baptism even in the early centuries of the church, has always wiped away all debt of punishment. Okay, so it's delivered from all of the debt of punishment. Now, if you think about this, right? So if someone had been, let's say, I don't know, like an, a serial adulterer and they're baptized, there might still be medicinal penances that they do, right? There are practices they, that they might do in order to help them heal from the bad habit they established as a pagan. So you can still have the medicinal function of, of penance without having this retributive idea. Purgatory is designed to punish. And I've written here, it has no other evident purpose but to punish. Now one might say, well, no, Sean, like purgatory is explicitly talked about as healing. Here's the problem. There was a bishop, I believe um, John Horniholt in England in the 18th century, 
who actually agrees that purgatory wouldn't exist without the punitive function of penance. And the reason is because you could have the healing done in the presence of Christ, right? Like at final judgment, we'll all have sin to confess. We'll all have things that we have that we're all accountable for before the Lord to confess, and He will heal us. But so you can have the healing function of purgatory, of uh, without the separation from God, without the retributive idea that constitutes the separation of God innate to the idea of purgatory. You can have purgation, in other words, without purgatory. The key, the chief function of purgatory as a separation from God, insofar as it's a separation from God, is to exact punishment. And the problem with that is that God could, right, apply the full merits of Christ to you every time he gives, every time you take the Eucharist, every time you repent, right? Because he does that in baptism. And he does that whenever you satisfy the conditions for a plenary indulgence, allegedly. So he could do that, and he just chooses not to. So God chooses, even though the merits of Christ could cover you, he chooses, simply by fiat, simply by an act of the will, to exact punishment even on his people in purgatory. This leads to problems, namely the trivialization of the body and blood of Jesus in the Eucharist. Anglicans and Presbyterians and Lutherans have a higher view of the Mass, I would argue, than Roman Catholics. Why? Because we would affirm that the full remission of the debt of sin is communicated through the body and blood given in the bread and the wine. According to Roman Catholic doctrine, you can only be assured that it affects at least the remission of some debt. You can't be sure that it remits all of the debt of punishment. Whereas for Anglicans, Presbyterians, and Lutherans, you can be sure that God fully renews your baptism because what you are taking in the Eucharist is the true body and blood of Christ. In other words, Rome elevates her pronunciations, her fiats of plenary indulgences over the body and blood of Christ with respect to the efficacy of taking away temporal debt. Or rather, I should say, that Rome elevates the satisfaction of the conditions of an indulgence over the reception of the true body and blood of Christ, and says that this, the satisfaction of the conditions of a plenary indulgence is more effective for taking away the debt of sin, the debt of punishment, than receiving the body and blood of Christ. We would say that trivializes the passion. Okay, and we have two more, two more slides here. Okay, so we're almost done. Humana vitae, I would argue, is an abject failure of logic, of theological reasoning. Now, there's some Protestants that would disagree with me on this, that hold that humana vitae was a good document, uh, that uh, all forms of birth control are wrong. So I, I realize I'm bucking against some Anglicans and even some Lutherans on this. Uh, now, here's the problem with humana vitae. Observing natural law is complicated by the fall. Humana Vitae's argument is that we cannot destroy the structures of nature. So the reason why glasses, for instance, are licit is because that's repairing and restoring the telos of the eye, which is to see, right? The reason why certain interventions are licit, like, um, I don't know, medication or whatever, is because they're restoring the telos of nature. But, the claim goes, artificial birth control is destroying that telos of nature. It's not aiding and restoring it, but destroying it. Okay, but here's the problem. It's very complicated to make that sort of argument on this side of the fall. On this side of the fall, we're always negotiating between created goods. We're always doing this balancing act. So, for instance, one might fast. And that fasting is a kind of destruction of the natural telos, right, of the digestive system. But you do that for the higher spiritual good of communion with Christ. Well, one might say, well, fasting isn't, isn't longstanding or permanent or whatever. Okay, I don't think that's a good argument because, of course, one could, as we will see, uh, I hold that uh, in marriage, they should aim, a married couple should aim to have children, 
right? That's that's not the same as saying all forms of birth control, of artificial birth control, are wrong, right? Uh, because you can plan to have kids. Uh, now, the the claim here being made uh, is that destroying the natural telos is, is wrong. But we do this in fasting, right? And we do this when we give our lives unto death, right, for Christ. When we give our lives unto death, we're certainly surrendering to the natural telos. If someone tells me to step into fire or deny Christ, right, I'm going to step into fire. And that is to destroy the natural telos of my body for the higher spiritual good of communion with Christ, given the complications of the fall, of living in a fallen world. Now, NFP is licit, and the claim is that it's licit because it's natural, because you're living in accordance with the natural telos of the body. But here's a kind of argument you can make, and this was actually written in the majority opinion, right? So the majority opinion during the time of Humane Vitae uh, actually disagreed with Humane Vitae, right? Uh, most of the theologians present in this decision recommended against that, recommended that artificial for forms of birth control that were not abortive were licit. Uh, and the reason is because given the fall, right, things are not regular. Things are not as ordered as they should be. The argument of Humane Vitae is that because of the natural cycles of a woman's body, this discloses to us that God has built into the body times where uh, you can have sex and not get pregnant and times where you can have sex to get pregnant, that God has sort of built the body for this. That's the claim. Okay, well, if that's the claim, then what could see artificial birth control as just restoring that purpose, right? As just restoring the sort of naturally inbuilt cycles so that planning can happen. And we all agree. Now, this is, this is to agree that abortive forms of birth control are wrong, right? We can all agree on that. But the logic doesn't sustain the claim that natural family planning is licit because we act against the natural telos of the body at times for higher order spiritual goods. And it's hard, sometimes hard to tell what the natural telos of the body is. And you could even make the argument that artificial birth control is actually restoring a natural telos insofar as it's sustained that God has built the body such that there are times where you can have sex and intentionally and not have kids. And there are times where you can have sex intentionally and, and conceive. Okay. So final, final argument here. Apostolica Cori. Okay. So I've addressed this elsewhere. This was the declaration that Anglican orders were invalid uh, and it was declared ex cathedra. Now, a lot of Roman Catholics sort of miss this. There's no document there's no, no document that says I am being declared ex cathedra. The way we know a document is ex cathedra is that it matches the conditions laid out in Vatican I, namely that the Pope is acting in his office as Pope, as the instructor of all Christians, and defines, decrees, and declares stuff. Well, that formula, I define, decree, declare, is used at the end of Apostolica Curae to declare Anglican orders invalid, so it's an ex cathedra pronunciation. Here's the problem. It rests on completely wrong historical data, a complete misunderstanding of the Anglican doctrine of the Eucharist. Rome's argument is that the Anglican Eucharist is invalid because the Anglican Church never intended to ordain priests to offer the Eucharist as a sacrifice. Now, what's true is that we didn't intend to ordain priests to offer the Eucharist as a sacrifice which wins merit that covers the temporal debt of sin. That's true, but the East didn't, doesn't do that either, right? And yet Eastern Orthodox orders are considered valid. But it's also false that we didn't intend that it was a sacrifice in the sense that Peter Lombard meant it. Thomas Cranmer in his Oxford Disputation quotes Peter Lombard approvingly. Uh, Hugh, uh, uh, Peter Martyr Vermigli does the same that it is, and of course, John Hooper, Bishop John Hooper does this in his uh, work that's still untranslated uh, of the Lord's Supper. Now, uh, Anglicans agreed that there's a sacramental representation of the once for all sacrifice of Christ, such that in taking the body and blood, you receive and renew a full remission of sins. Okay, so, so clearly we think the Eucharist, by mediating the passion of Christ, forgive sins. That's not the issue. The critique 
of the propitiatory sacrifice of the mass. You always see this in the Anglican sources launched against, for instance, launched in connection with the use of the private mass, where a priest could perform the mass and ex opere operato, just by the sort of working of the sacrifice, win merit for non-participants, right? So the idea is that they perform an act which the people of God do not have to receive. And the main thing about that act is sort of this performance of sacrifice, which wins merit. And receiving the elements is sort of accidental. It doesn't need to happen. It's nice if it does, but it's not the main point. That's what Anglicans were critiquing. So Apostolic Akurai completely misunderstands Anglican theology on the Eucharist in the 16th and 17th centuries. And as such, that means an ex cathedra declaration rests on obviously false logic. So let's recap here this sort of uh, this sort of one one stop shop case against Rome. Rome claims to be a mere teacher of the apostolic teaching, de verbum. This is false, as we've seen, because Rome has added things to the apostolic teaching as necessary to salvation, and she has restricted gifts that Jesus has explicitly given to the church. And as such, she claims for herself that authority to say where Christ has said, you may, you may not, and you will be damned if you do. She does not have that authority because no church has that authority to speak over Christ. Finally, Rome teaches manifest incoherencies on marriage, birth control, purgatory, and of course, as I've already mentioned, adds requirements to salvation. I hope this was helpful in canvassing, I think, a lot of the issues in I think, you know, somewhat of a concise way, this has been an hour, but, you know, uh, I hope this sort of condenses a lot of issues and presents it. So I hope this is helpful to you in your reflection on these issues. I hope this is helpful in our dialogue together to my Roman Catholic brothers and sisters as we continue to wrestle together for the good and unity of the church. God bless.